I'm going to talk to you about scaling business education through online means. Uh, obviously, um, there's a lot of opportunities for all of you to go online. You can do it on your own websites with using your campus LMSs. You can work with lots of other companies, edX, 2U, University of Ventures, Pearson, um, and so on. But um, uh, I'm, I'm going to focus on Coursera, not because, just because that's the only place I can get good data. So uh, you'll hear the Coursera side of the story primarily, but it, the general principles apply whatever platform you choose to use in online education. So let me start with some of the challenges that both young professionals are facing and that business schools are facing. So on the young professional side, the world is really changing. Technology is driving job requirements to change faster than, it, than I think at any time in our history. So that there's a tremendous amount of mobility across jobs a tip, it's been estimated that the typical millennial will have 13 to 15 jobs during a lifetime, will move around. We certainly see this in Silicon Valley. People change jobs every two or three years. Um, and so, um, and then also, many jobs are, are newly coming into existence. This whole field of, you know, big data analysis, it was just referred to. Um, the new tools for analyzing very large data sets with the computational power we have today Allows, allows businesses and all kinds of organizations to do an analytic work that would have been infeasible just a decade ago. And so there's a tremendous demand for that field. We, we, see, it, we see it at Coursera. I'm sure you're seeing it on your campuses. Um, and it's not just the techies. It's not just computer scientists and statisticians. It's people in marketing and, and all, kinds of, uh, all kinds of dimensions and financial modeling and so forth in business, any kind of predictive um, activity. So the world is changing very fast, and because people change frequently their careers and because job requirements change, people are going to need continual upskilling and reskilling during the course of their careers. It's not just come to business school, go out into the world, and that's the end of it. It's a continuing process, and you can play a role in that lifelong learning activity that's going to be necessary for the people you're educating on your campuses. Now, the challenges for business school are well known. You're, you're getting very expensive for your residential programs. The, the, you know, the rate of increase is you know, more or less about 5% a year in real terms over the last decade. That's a lot. Um, the, um, maybe 4% a year in, in, uh, over the last decade. And you, the, the MBA applications are it, at many schools, at the majority of schools, are starting to decline. Um, uh, the the um, acceptance rate went up in 23 of the top 25 MBA programs, so that's an indication um, that 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 you know things are a little bit challenging right now. And because there's it's good students are more scarce, there's more competition for them, and so so business schools are spending more to on financial aid and other in, incentives to attract uh, to attract students to their campuses. So we've got a market that's changing for, for, for education that's really changing dramatically. And we have some challenges to our traditional programs. There's an obvious answer, which is use the power of technology to scale yourself and make yourself more relevant to the modern world. So what we've discovered at, at Coursera, we started four years ago. Um, two years ago, we invented essentially a new credential, which is a specialization. It's essentially four four-week courses. Some of them are five or six courses, but most of them are four four-week courses. About the, the, core, uh, the uh, about, uh, in terms of content, it's roughly the equivalent of uh, of one full year full year course over two semesters. Um, these are focused on specific skills in business and technology and data science. And here are some examples of programs that are offered by leading business schools. The, the uh, digital marketing program at Illinois, uh, the, the um, uh, you know, a program from uh, Virginia focused on uh, career development, program from Wharton focused on business and financial modeling, and one on leadership from the University of Michigan. Examples of these credentials. Now, they are really, they are, they're, they're interesting in the way we structure this. We have our courses on this fan diagram. The courses are the, are the, are the lower semicircle, and they s essentially stack into specializations, which are the wedges in the next arc. 
And then um, you can go a step further and stack courses into specializations and specializations into degree programs, which I'll come to in a minute. But what we've learned in this, what I would say is a disruption in the labor market, if not the educational mar uh, space, is that these certificates are really catching on. So course, course and specialization certificates are the second most frequently cited credential on LinkedIn, and the most frequently cited is Microsoft credentials, which have been around for 35 years. Uh, we'll soon pass them and, and, and be the, <laughs> the logo you see most on LinkedIn. Um, it is getting salience. Companies are starting to consider this in their recruitment processes. Learners are proud to post these credentials from high prestige schools uh, on, their, uh, on their resumes. Um, now, Coursera has grown dramatically. We reached a, we're reaching a very large audience. The numbers uh, uh, used in the introduction are already out of date. In fact, the 21 million in another week will hit 22 million learners on our platform. Um, uh, that's you know, about a million at any time, over a million at any month, uh, will be actively engaged in coursework. Um, we have 145 university partners, over 1,500 courses, and, uh, and 150 of these multi-course sequences called specializations. Um, it's the, the scale offers some enormous advantages, uh, and we're getting results. The results we're getting are actually um, quite remarkable. In the Harvard Business Review last, a year ago, uh, uh, last month, year ago this month, we, uh, we published an article with researchers from the University of Pennsylvania collaborating with Coursera that, where we surveyed 50,000 course completers on, on, on Coursera and, and we asked them what were they, why were they taking the courses. Now about 52% of the learners uh, reported that they were seeking career benefit. Another third or so reported they were seeking educational benefit. Others were just were just uh, you know wanted the social experience or something like that. So, of the 52 percent who were looking for career benefit from the courses, 87 percent reported that they got benefits from these courses, and 33 percent reported a tangible benefit. They got a promotion, a raise, started a new job, um, uh, uh, or 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 indeed started a business on their own. Uh, we, th we think this is a dramatic result, and frankly, I just heard the other day from edX that they've done another survey just out a, a, year, a year later, which had a very similar findings, except the percentage with a tangible result had gone to 43% from 53%. So it, it, this is here. It's here to stay. It's going to make an important, uh, I think it's going to make an important um, mark on the labor market, and it's going to be the way, I think, that that uh, young people operate in order to show that their careers are advancing, that they're acquiring new skills, and that they're, and that they're keeping themselves relevant um, uh, to the changing needs of the workplace. Um, the next step is to go beyond the massive open online course and specializations into, uh, into degrees. This is a little more scary for, um, for uh, business schools, I think, to contemplate because you could think of it as competing with yourself. Um, but actually, we've not found that to be the case so far. Um, uh, what, 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 a, what, a, what doing an online degree does, and many of you have programs already, um, typically on your own websites, um, what, it, what it offers is, is flexibility for students so that students in, who are at work can continue to take uh, can, can, can actually get a degree in the workplace, just as they can earn credentials, um, smaller credentials at the workplace. The, 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 the reach to those students is powerful because they no longer have to, um, they, they, students don't have to contemplate the very expensive proposition of sacrificing two years of income plus the travel expenses and relocation expenses, plus the tuitions of residential programs. So flexibility is one big advantage. Um, and we're finding, at least initially, that, that uh, from essentially surveys of potential learners, that the majority, far, far away the big majority of students who are signing up for online programs are not, really weren't contemplating a residential program. This is their only way to get a business degree. Um, 
we, you, if you this if you go with this approach, you're looking at a massive market. In other words, a very a, a multiple of many times multiple of the potential market that you have now for people that would be interested in a high cost residential program. And finally, the credentials, um, which I'll explain, come back to in a minute, are stackable. Degrees are composed of smaller units uh, that that give you a credential along the way. So if you start a program online, you don't walk away with nothing. You walk away with a specialization certificate, maybe even with a certificate issued by a university. Um, I will say uh, the following. We have one MBA out there already on Coursera. Of course, there are, there are many other online MBA programs uh, around. But the University of Illinois launched its program in uh, January of 2016. Uh, Jeff Brown is in the audience, will be speaking on the next panel, the dean at, at Illinois. So you'll hear probably quite a bit more than I'm going to say about it. But the, um, you know, the, the, the really impressive things about this, one, it's highly affordable. It's, it, the, the cost is essentially $20,000. Um, it's 100% online. There's no residential uh, dimension to it. But there is a, essentially low touch and high touch components. You could take the open specializations on Coursera. Um, and then, uh, and then, if you're admitted into the program, uh, you you um, you then take a high touch layer of content on the same subjects you covered in the open uh, in the in the open courses, uh, and you and you have higher you know, more attention from faculty and more project based learning in those high touch courses than you do in the open specializations. Um, we've. We've um, seen an extraordinarily high quality of applicant. I mean, our, our platform alone, this is one of the big advantages of that Coursera offers, is that with our nearly 22 million base of learners, there's a tremendous, it's a, that's a very large platform to market to, very large population to, 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 to direct your marketing, and you can do it for free. That is, it's not, it's not, you don't have to pay a lot for customer acquisition, it essentially we send emails off of the Coursera, uh, uh, out of Coursera, to to help you recruit students, and we work with you to nurture the funnel. I mean, I think the initial announcement of the of the Illinois program generated essentially 15,000 leads that uh, that uh, that you know to produce a class of about a hundred initial cohort of about 120. So there's um, there's a lot of opportunity out there. Um, the applicants were very high quality and, and uh, you know, comparable to perhaps better than uh, the, the, those, those seen applying to the residential uh, program. Just, and they're all over the world. Um, the, the, our, our platform reaches, um, uh, of the people we reach, 75% are international, only 25% from the United States. And, um, and of the international students, actually 45% of our total uh, student population come from developing uh, countries, emerging economies, um, which is a, obviously a population that many of you would like to tap. Um, there's very high retention so far. The first cohort is still, that started in January, is still 97% with us, uh, which is exciting. And there's, there's revenue in this, um, because not only is there revenue from the MBA program itself, the open specializations have an enrollment that's much higher than the program. The, the degree program is 120 students in the first cohort, and r roughly the same number in the second cohort that started in August. Uh, it's going to scale larger than that, but it'll still be you know hundreds per year rather than many thousands. But many thousands are taking the open specializations and paying and paying for them. So in fact, the revenue from the specializations alone is already in excess of two million dollars. Um, so it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a terrific model we think, uh, and we are in conversation with a bunch of other uh, institutions about offering different types of degrees on Coursera. Uh, and we think this is it, this will explode this space. Um, we think it's we think the online degrees are better for a large class of learners. Obviously, some of the components of a residential program simply can't be replicated. I mean, the experience of being with living with a cohort of, of talented young people, forming the networking connections that you that you sustain through a lifetime, that, that that experience is going to be more vivid in a residential program. So at this stage will be the experience of interaction in the classroom. But you know, as the technology evolves, 
the, both the social experience online and the classroom um, high touch experience will evolve and get stronger. I'm not saying it will replicate uh, what we do on campuses, and I would I would never say that you know anything will remotely approach the kind of full service experience that we all that all of our institutions give to undergraduates, um, uh, which is you know an important stage of their life as form, uh, in, for, in, in formative years. But it's a, for many, many people, for millions of people, this will be the only affordable substitute, something that, you know, make university education and business school education possible in a way that it effectively wasn't, or quality education effectively uh, available to them in the past. I mean, we have so many stories of learners in countries like India where this is just the experience of taking courses from schools of the highest caliber is mind-boggling for them. I mean, they're going to, you know, even if they're in college, uh, in university at a, at a fairly mediocre place with seemingly not much hope for their, for their careers, this is an awakening that's extraordinary and gives people some tremendous value. Um, we, think, uh, uh, we think also that reaching people online is an, is an improvement for universities. It, first of all, it just expands the scale of, of your impact on the world. Business schools all aspire, I think, not just to educate students, but to, but to create an impact on the global business community, to be known for something they've contributed. This allows a global pool of students. It allows your reputations to grow uh, beyond your local, your local communities. Um, there's a huge funnel of potential students out there that, 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 that would be opened up you know, far beyond even the funnel that you know, we, we heard about from the GMAT, uh, from the GMAT uh, activities. There's just, you know, there's, there's millions more who are potentially interested in business education around the world. Um, and as I mentioned, this tends to reach students who would not otherwise enroll in full-time programs. Um, and the, quali the quality is terrifically high. Learning, learning results are, there's a lot of research now that shows that mastery of content is as good or better online than it is live. There are aspects of live teaching, of course, that, that's highly interactive, that doesn't quite get replicated. But our courses are structured in such a way that there's frequent interruption for quizzes and assignments so that students don't lose interest, they stay engaged, and, and the actual um, learning results are, are, are powerful and, and impressive. One of the great features, it was, one of, it was a real revelation to me when I thought about it, um, one of the great uh, features of learning online is you never have to get lost. If you're sitting in a lecture in a, on a technical subject, thin, thin one course or some, something that's maybe challenging to some of our students or, the, or, a, or a, a statistics or decision science course, and you get lost in the first five minutes of some mathematical argument, you have no recourse but to sit there for the rest of the, t for the, rest of the lecture and just be confused. Whereas online, you watch the first five minutes, you take a quiz, you recognize you didn't get it, you go back and rewind and start over and listen to it again and again until you get it. And that, that is a powerful tool for mastery. And, and we, 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 we have many learners who comment on the power of that, of that possibility. Now, in addition to head, heading that direction toward online degrees, the other new direction for Coursera is to reach out to the, the business community. And we announced just two weeks ago the introduction of a Coursera for Business product, which we're marketing into, um, into corporate learning and development departments. It's amazing, the receptivity. Because we're really offering, and, and, and I mean, you could be offering something different. Business schools now offer, you know, typically very high-touch, in-person programs for the top layers of an organization. Um, we can scale. We can, we, we can take material that university business schools produce and make them available to the whole population of a company. Um, this is, it, it, and I must say the corporate L&D people and CEOs that we've talked to are very excited about this because we offer, we offer something that is um, essentially not uh, available elsewhere, which is deeper treatment of, of, of subjects that people need to know to retrain, to upskill, to move to the next level. 
um, to learn about managing people and teams, to learn about new financial techniques, to learn about the latest um, uh, skills in data analytics. Those are, those are all now possibilities for companies instead of using what they traditionally use, which is their own on-site trainers who aren't necessarily as up to speed, clearly aren't as up to speed as your professors, and, 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 and secondly, um, using essentially the market that's out there for, on, for online are really short videos for the most part. They're not deeper treatments, uh, but the excitement about, you know, using, a, 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 you know, taking a sequence of courses from Wharton is palpable among chief learning officers who see the obvious superiority of, these, of this material to what they can buy. I won't mention the commercial vendors that, send, you know, that sell 30-minute videos, basically, that, into that market. So we see a lot of opportunity for business schools in this space, frankly, not just business schools, but engineering schools, computer science departments, statistics and data science departments, because what, what, what we offer is not just depth, but breadth across business topics and, and other technical topics, and indeed, we have, a, we have a, one of our pioneer clients um, is Axis Bank of India. They asked us to design learning pathways for 21 types of, stu of occupations in their company. Um, and for some of them who are outward facing salespeople, they, they actually, they thought these people had more culture. And so in the mix of courses that, that uh, those outward facing people take, is an introduction to classical music course from Yale. So it's 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 not it's not all business, but the, the the largest chunk of demand is definitely for business for business courses in this space. It's um, I think it's going to really change uh, uh, the way that um, training within the company takes place. By the way, we see we're seeing you know for those of you interested in this, we're seeing two models sort of evolving. It's very early days. We've only you know we've only been at it for a few months. But we see two kinds of customer interests. One is specific training. The, 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 so let me give you an example. Bank of New York Mellon is, is onboarding all of its new software engineers by giving them one of the Coursera specializations. The, the new software engineers take two weeks before they start their jobs and go through the Hong Kong University of Science specialization in full stack web development. They learn the tools that, that they can then employ on the job uh, and get on and have a common footing when they start. So that's a very specific training need. I mentioned Access Bank where they're basically p picking three courses each for each of 21 categories of employees that are relevant to the skills those categories need. So those are very specific focused um, objectives of the company. The other model is I just want to be a good employer. I just want to offer my students an opportunity for advanced learning and be known as, as, a, as an employer with, with, who can provide you know, perquisites of this type to everyone. And so those are people that more interested in like a catalog-wide license or maybe a somewhat curated license to, to just allow their employees the opportunity to take these courses and then to encourage an atmosphere of learning. We're, um, we're, we're, looking, really, we're, we're looking forward to see how these two models develop, but we have customers essentially of both types at this point. And just to re reiterate the, the one other point, because when I talk to business school audiences, there's some consternation, you know, is this going to eat our lunch? Well, no, one, business schools are the providers, and two, I, I really think of this as complementary to and not competitive with the traditional executive education, because traditional executive education programs, for the most part, are not dealing with the base of the pyramid. I mean, this is, you know, the, within an organization, you're usually hitting the top layers. And we're, we're, we're focused on what's, scale, what's scalable for other folks. And in fact, um, I, I will say Wharton is an example. Wharton is actually, we're, we're actually co-marketing with Wharton, you know, entries into companies where we're selling a package of, you know, high touch services from Wharton at traditional high prices. And the low cost Wharton MOOCs and specializations that are, that are on our platform to a company all as one, all as one piece. So that's a, that's a real opportunity, I think, for you. So um, that sort of sums it up. I'm happy to take questions. I think we've got about eight or 10 minutes left, and I'm happy to, to hear from you. I mean, you know, hear your concerns or answer your questions. Thanks.
I think there's mics up front if you want to step up. <clears throat> Hi. Uh, good morning, Tim Landers. Sorry, Tim Landers from Ramapo College. Um, an idea that's been rattling around in academia for some time is the idea of uh, competency-based education. And it's already available in many and required in many disciplines, mostly in scientific endeavors. But now it's starting to creep into other areas. And when I hear you talk about certification, it almost sounds like competency-based education where a student can acquire that skill at their own time and pace. That's right. So in your mind, I'm just wondering if you uh, think the two are connected, and if so, whether or not certification needs some other kind of standing so that it really satisfies uh, some measure of competency-based um, success. Yep, uh, you're, right on, you're right on the target. Uh, that's where we're headed. Right now we're working on mapping all of our courses to, to actually indicate you know, what competencies they're aimed at, and as we source new courses from our university partners, we're actually very explicitly saying, here are the skills and competencies we want to develop. So design courses to, to hit those targets. The other part of it, of course, is developing the assessments that really do, that really do demonstrate competency. Um, we've seen, we've, we've got, you know, that's, that's, um, that's gonna take a lot of work, and we, you know, we have people at Coursera doing very sophisticated analysis of, of um, what the content of our courses actually is in order to try to describe more accurately what are the competencies that are being tested for and in fact to generate multiple assessments. One of the concerns on our platform is, with, with this platform is, well, you know, how, how is it, is it too easy? How do, you, how do you ensure academic integrity? And one way is to have a really large pool of assessments that circulates around so that people can't cheat, basically. Um, and we're, we're going to be gener we're gonna use machine learning to basically generate the, you know, get, instructors will give us their templates and we'll generate many more assessments that, that essentially are at the same level of difficulty and higher and lower levels of difficulty so we can test students. So yes, we're headed toward a company ba competency based framework. And as we go into the corporate learning departments, they're very interested in this. They, they, they do want to know exactly, you know, which courses map to which skills, and because they in turn are trying to map skills to their jobs. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a new world. Hi there, uh, David Hummels, Purdue University. So you're an economist. Yep. Um, how long or how many entrants will it take before price is driven to marginal cost? <laughs> um, well, price, price will, Price isn't at marginal cost now, right? Price is actually above marginal cost, but barely covering uh, full costs. So, so uh, no, won't, marginal cost is actually very low in, online. Um, I, I, you know, obviously, people aren't going to get in the game. It's really the test: is is a program going to break even or not? And and how soon will it be before these programs only break even? Good, that's a good question. Uh, how many of your business schools only break even? <laughs> uh, probably a lot of them. You're just embarrassed to admit it, right? So, so, um, so, yes. I, it won't take. It'll, it'll take uh, a number of years. Of course, better. Just as is the case now, higher quality courses will earn rents. They will get. They will have higher. Uh, you know, they will have higher margins be, because people will pay. Will pay more for the premium quality. So, um, we'll see. But you know, right now, if you get in early, it looks pretty good. I'm Sardar Dinch uh, from Finance Department at Rutgers Business School. Mm -hmm. um, I actually took your courses, some of your courses, oh, including from some other uh, platforms uh, as well. Um, my impression is that the best online courses are the ones that are uh, designed for uh, online uh, exactly. platform rather than just a regular classroom uh, course Correct. tweaked a little bit. So as a faculty, uh, if uh, we are to design uh, an online course, uh, should we do it for an, uh, using an open source platform or use a, a proprietary uh, platform like Coursera and uh, be dependent uh, on it for the future of that uh, course? Uh, what are your thoughts on well, open okay. source? Um, first of all, let me just underscore the first point you made, which is 
online teaching does take it, it, it is different, and you know what doesn't work well is just putting a, ca a camera in the classroom and watching the professor talk to an audience that, that's not you. So the much more effective to have the professor shoot it in the studio, looking or or his or her own webcam looking straight into the in, into the uh, camera so there so you get the feeling that the professor is actually talking to you when you're the online learner also you can use visuals and animations and 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 other other tools much more effectively online and someday probably virtual reality settings as well so so designing an online course is an art in itself and it's it's a young art we're learning we're learning what's better as we go along but it is different, so that's an important point. As for open source versus um, versus uh, a proprietary platform, you're basically saying Coursera or edX, which do you prefer? Well, I, I, I will tell you, um, you know, from my point of view, I think, I think we, our platform lacks the flexibility that a very computer savvy, you know, professor can do with an open source platform. So they can, they, you know, they can basically create their own environments. If you're really tech savvy, there's some advantage to that. But, but our, our, our actual standard platform has a lot of very attractive features and, and, um, and, and it's also easier to author. I mean, we, if you're authoring, it's really quite transparent now. Early days it was not. Today, you know, you, can, you actually could do a whole course just sitting in your office, um, even without, and, you know, maybe with a tech support person. But the tools are pretty, are pretty simple in, in terms of shooting video, uploading it, uploading quizzes and assignments and, 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 and that sort of thing. And we're trying to make it easier and easier for authoring. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a matter of taste and a matter of uh, choice. I mean, uh, one big advantage we have over edX and any other open source platform is scale. We're, we're two and a half times bigger. Um, and that, so we, we reach a larger audience. But I, you know, I think edX is doing some great work and they have fabulous courses. And, you know, there's plenty of room for multiple platforms. It's a very large market. We have two more questions. Sure. Well. Okay, terrific. Yes, I'm Emilio Delia from Rutgers University. First of all, thank you for a very interesting conversation, uh, very short and to the point. Thanks. I was wondering if you could share with us the challenges and issues that schools face when they contemplate moving to a model like you have proposed. I'm very interested in understanding the kinds of internal things that are happening and other issues that they may face. Thank yeah. you. Well, it's, you know, this is happening so fast that many of our university partners are kind of overwhelmed by, this, by the speed of change. I mean, literally, the MOOC appeared, you know, in the fall of 2011, where Sarah and edX and Udacity were formed in April of 2012. Um, it's it's very young and it's moved a long way in a very short time. So, and as we know, faculties adapt slowly to change. So, what we're what we're seeing is, you know, in most places, is to really succeed in taking root in an institution. And of our 145 partners, I would say, you know, there's only really a third of them or a quarter of them where it's, I would say it's really taken root, they're, where they're really committed to the idea. And it takes it takes faculty pioneers. I mean, it really takes the first few people to do to do it and get excited and start proselytizing amongst their colleagues, like anything else in a university. That is, without faculty support, it's a dead you know it's a dead letter. So we've had very good administrative support in our most active partners. Usually, there's somebody in the central administration, a vice provost or a dean, who's very excited about driving this forward on their campus, but those people have to convince some faculty leaders to get engaged. And uh, it was certainly our experience at Yale, is, is, uh, is it, it took, um, it, we had to develop a cadre of pioneers. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, Francois Romagné, Wisconsin School of Business. In, in the past, we've paid for research and researchers by bundling residential education with the research. As you play out the world the way you see it and the way you are playing it out uh, for us, um, five, ten years from now, who's paying for research and the researchers? Yeah. I, I, you know, I think it's going to be a long time before online um, supplants the residential experience of undergraduate education. I mean, I think, you know, I, I think for at, at least a decade, probably longer, 
there will be, you know, the, the great majority of people using our courses are, are going to be additive to the population that universities are educating now. Um, and it will be the same people after they graduate. I mean, 78% of our learners are over age 22. And, and you know, they're in the workplace, um, a big chunk between 22 and 40 trying to upgrade their skills. That is your population for graduate programs. Um, uh, but I think that, you know, what, what's happening is you're just reaching more people uh, than you would otherwise reach. Um, so I don't think the system of research support is threatened yet. I'm not saying it won't be. I think, I think that there will be all kinds of opportunity, all kinds of innovations around this. Like one thing that's sort of inevitable, we're not pushing this now because it, it seems premature, but as the quality of these courses increases and as the, uh, I think you'll see more universities starting to share and import courses from other schools in order to economize on, um, you know, the cost of education. So uh, where we think we'll see this first is overseas. And in fact, we are talking with one university system in India about taking some of our content and, and putting it into their undergraduate program. So, you know, it'll be kind of a test. But I think countries like India and Brazil, where the aspiration is to take the gross enrollment ratio from 10 to 30 percent in two decades, I mean, they're never going to get there by bricks and mortar and by training up enough professors to do that. So, so, um, so the alternative of using, of, of just expanding the scale of their existing schools by using technology seems very attractive. The, the U.S. will be, will take much longer, I think, to be transformed. So thank you very much. I enjoyed the opportunity to interact. I'll be around for the rest of the morning. Thank you.